1776 was a landmark year in American history for two reasons. One is a reason that everybody knows. The other is a reason that, well, it's uh, often forgotten if it was ever known at all. The first reason, 1776, was it was the year that the uh, Declaration of Independence was adopted. And the Declaration of Independence says that all men are created equal. De the Declaration of Independence was America's Declaration, well, of Independence, but it was also it was also the announcement to the world that the United States was creating this new country, a republic, a republic based on the principle of equality. The term democracy was not yet in current favorable usage, but it would be soon enough. And the United States would evolve into a democracy and the Declaration of Independence with the statement, all men are created equal, is, became uh, the blueprint, the charter for American democracy. There was a second document, a second publication in the year 1776. And it didn't have to do with democracy, it had to do with something else. It was authored by a man named Adam Smith, and it was called, it was a book, it was called The Wealth of Nations, more precisely an inquiry into the causes and so on of the wealth of nations. It's commonly known as The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations. And it became the blueprint not for democracy, but for capitalism, for an economic system based on the, the operations of a free market on private property, private enterprise. And it would give birth to capitalism. Capitalism not only in Britain, it was published in Scotland, and he was, uh, Adam Smith was Scottish, and it was, it became the blueprint for American capitalism as well. So, now fast forward to the 21st century, or you could have stopped in the 20th century, you could have stopped in the late 19th century, and if somebody asked you for a quick and dirty description of the United States, of America's political system, of its economic system, of its way of organization, it, of its basic institutions and the value systems that go with them. You could do, you could have done, and even today, you could do far worse than to say that those two, those two nouns that describe the United States are democracy and capitalism. Democracy, this is the way the United States organizes its politics. It's based on the principle, yes, that all men are created equal. And in fact, it's spread out and all men, women, people are created equal. Now, it's not a perfect description of American politics. Some people are more equal than others. Some people have more wealth than others and can spend it in politics and so on. But it is both a rough approximation and it is an aspiration. This is what the point of democracy is, to provide for and to enact equality in politics. One person, one vote. That's the basic idea. That's democracy, and it follows from Jefferson's Declaration of Independence with its embrace of equality, all men are created equal. So one of the nouns, one of the, the things that characterize the United States is democracy. The other is capitalism. Capitalism is this system of economics. It's the way the United States, by and large, organizes America's, Americans' economic activities. So private property is a big deal in the United States, and free markets are the way we barter exchange, we trade goods, the way we organize decisions in this country. Now, uh, democracy, and capitalism, these two institutions, these two sets of values in American life. And if you want, as I say, a quick and dirty description of the United States, democracy, capitalism. Now, once again, I have to say that the United States is not a pure democracy. There are aspects in which the democratic values sometimes get overlooked or overridden. Capitalism, the United States is not an entirely capitalist economy. Um, in fact, uh, if it were a purely capitalist economy, there would be no large government institutions intruding into the economic sphere. There wouldn't be, for example, public higher education, public universities, because that's something that is done in the private sector. There are plenty of private colleges and universities. Uh, but in this country, we have what economists actually call a mixed economy. It's mostly capitalist. What's the other part? What's the, 
the counterpart, the opposite of capitalism in economic terms, it's socialism, where property is not privately owned, but it's owned by the public. It's typically owned by the state. And decisions are not always made by the marketplace, where people say, okay, I've got something to sell, and you want something to buy, and let's agree on a price. Very often, prices are mandated from some central office. So, the opposite of capitalism in the economic sphere is socialism. And again, the American economy has some aspects of socialism. Um, education is one. Uh, most of the roads we drive on in this country are owned by, maintained by some branch of government, whether it's a county road or a state highway or a federal interstate. But there are private roads. We call them toll roads. Private companies build them and you have to pay have to pay each time you go through. We pay, of course, for the public highways, but we pay them, pay for them through taxes. So, I mean, everything's got to be paid for. But a reminder that the United States is predominantly capitalist, but there are aspects of socialism as well. Now, uh, what's the opposite of democracy in politics? Well, you could have, I mean, there are various opposites, but they're autocracies of some sort. Democracy means rule by the demos, the people. And you could have rule by a king, a monarchy, or queen. You could have a dictatorship, where this isn't a monarch, but it's one person governing everything. The general term for those is uh, autocracy. And even sort of shy of that, there's aristocracy, where the wealthy, educated, well-connected, a small group of people run the government. And, you know, one can argue that in the United States, uh, you have a better chance of getting on the Supreme Court if you have a law degree from Harvard or Yale. So, there are aspects of aristocracy. If you look at the, the wealth of the people who are in the United States Senate, most of them are millionaires. So, yeah, it's not quite true that everybody is equal. But, but again, it's like, so the, the American economy is mostly capitalist with some aspects of socialism in it. The American political system is mostly democratic with, other as with aspects of other systems in there anyway. Anyhow, so this is a rough approximation and one way of looking at American history from the 18th century, from the beginning until today, is to examine how these two systems, democracy, capitalism, and the values that go with them, how they have played off of each other over time. So, it's important to bear in mind that the United States was not born a democracy, nor was the American economy born capitalist. In fact, in 1776, as I suggested earlier, Americans weren't particularly crazy about the idea of democracy. The people who signed the Declaration of Independence, the people who wrote the Constitution, these were not just your ordinary folks. These were aristocrats. These were an elite. And most of them believed that if you handed government power, if you handed decision-making responsibility over to ordinary people, they would surely screw it up. This is why we have a Senate, for example, and the senators are they were originally chosen not by voters, they were chosen by the state legislatures. And it was thought that the members of the state legislatures would know the individuals and they'd choose the best people. When we choose a president, we don't, we voters don't choose the president, the electors choose the president. Now, the electors have become a rubber stamp for majority state by state, but originally the electors were, they were the equivalent of lawmakers, if you choose a member of the House of Representatives, the member of the House of Representatives gets elected and then that member exercises his or her own conscience judgment. They, they're not bound to do what their constituents say. They're bound by their conscience and their judgment and, and whatever they think is right. And the electors were supposed to do the same thing. It, the, the idea was not that the electors would automatically do what a majority in the elector states had, if only because at the beginning the electors themselves were not generally chosen by voters. They were chosen again by the state legislatures. Anyway, the point here is that the Constitution of the United States, the, frame, the framework for the government we have, was written as much against democracy as it was in favor of democracy. But, but things changed over time and by the 1820s, 1830s, the idea that ordinary people could actually exercise and should actually exercise political power had caught on. And we've been there ever since. We've been improving our democracy. So at first, 
in the 1790s, only adult, with some exceptions, only adult white males with property and long residence in wherever they lived could vote. By the 1820s, the property qualifications had gone away for the most part, and likewise the, the lengthy residential qualifications. And so by the 1830s, if you were a, an adult white male in America, you could vote. Now, obviously, that leaves out a lot of people. If you were African American, you probably couldn't vote. Even in some places you could, but by and large, you couldn't. That was fixed, or at least that was addressed, by the 15th Amendment to the Constitution in 1870 that said that the right to vote cannot be abridged on account of race or previous condition of servitude. So basically, race is no longer a factor. Everybody gets to vote. Now, it was a long way and a long time between from the passage of that amendment to actual voting of large numbers of black people in the South. It took till the 1960s. So once again, it's important to distinguish what happens on paper from what happens on the ground. But if it's on paper, at least that points in the direction the country is going or says it's going. So, and it took till 1920 for women to get the vote. And so, but, but the franchise, the right to vote, the equality before the ballot box has increased. It's worth considering, uh, does it have any farther to go? Well, in fact, in the early 1970s, it went a little farther. Until then, to be adult in a political sense meant you had to be 21. The voting age was lowered to 18. Is that as low as it can go? After all, there's still a large chunk of the population today that is not equal before the ballot box, and that is people under the age of 18. Now, per, you'll have your own opinion on this. Uh, you might think that, yeah, if you're old enough to drive, 16, let's say, you're old enough to vote. Others might say, now, what do 16-year-olds, what do 17-year-olds know? It's worth bearing in mind that exactly those arguments were made against giving women the vote, against giving black people the vote. They're not educated enough. They don't have enough of a stake in the system. Those arguments were overcome, so it's not out of the question that 16 year olds will be able to vote. How low could it go? Could it go to 14? Could it go to 12? I got my doubts about that. But anyway, so that's sort of the story of democracy by, well, a very quick story of democracy. By the 1830s, the idea of democracy had caught on. And no longer could somebody credibly say, you know what, that person over there, that farmer, that mechanic, that blacksmith, he's not qualified to vote. They still say she's not qualified to vote or that former slave's not qualified to vote, but those would go away. Anyway, so roughly speaking, democracy in the United States emerged and took hold in the first half of the 19th century. And so in 1800, now democracy was not a commonly held idea. By 1850, Yep, democracy was a commonly held idea. And you had to make excuses or you had to rationalize why there were infringements on the vote. Okay, that's democracy. What about capitalism? The country was not born capitalist. And the idea that you could form businesses and the purpose of business was profit and you would hire workers and that all of these activities should, should by and large be free from government control. Sure, people owned private property before 1776, before Adam Smith wrote his book, Wealth of Nations, but it was not considered to be a right independent of government regulation. The, the general feeling was regarding economics was that the economy ought to be governed by, well, the government. The government would set regulations. The government would determine what's important. One of the things that was important in economics in the British Empire, and, and until the middle of 1776, the American colonies were part of the British Empire, the basic policy was, so the point of economics in the British Empire was for the government in London to acquire as much money, gold and silver, as possible. The point of having colonies was to provide resources within the British Empire that the British needed. And furthermore, to basically milk those resources and milk those colonies for the benefit of the, the home country. And so a country was wealthy, an economy was doing well to the degree that the government and the people in the home country were, were amassing gold and silver. The term for this is mercantilism. 
and it labored under the heavy hand of government. And this is one of the things that annoyed the American colonists, annoyed them eventually to the point of revolution, that the, the regulations imposed upon them, the taxes, the restrictions on where they could trade, the, um, the infringements on the kind of money that they could use, these were things that eventually drove the Americans to revolution. But even once Americans got independent, it still took a while for the idea that, well, in a capitalist economy, the government steps out of the way. You don't look to government regulation. The government doesn't tell people what to do, how many loaves of bread that bakers should bake and how many pairs of shoes cobblers should make. No, you leave that to the marketplace, what Adam Smith called the invisible hand of the marketplace. And the basic idea is if people need shoes, then they'll go looking for people who make shoes. And if there aren't enough people who make shoes right now, then the demand for shoes will cause more people to make shoes or the people who are already making shoes to make more of them. And so demand will engender supply. And who will set the price? Well, that will be established by the balance between supply and demand. If there is tremendous demand and short supply, the price will go up. But as it goes up, then it will bring more of that thing onto the market. This is the model for Uber and Lyft the ride-sharing services. Prices go up when lots of, I mean, yeah, fares go up when lots of people want rides and the, the rising fares cause more Uber drivers to get in their cars and come pick people up. And so it's a, a real-time response adjustment of um, supply and demand and prices rise to, to bring more of the supply online. So the idea that government should turn the economy loose, this was a scary thing. Because, wait a minute, is this thing really going to work on its own? And for a long time, there were large parts of the world where people didn't believe it in, in the 20th century. Uh, two of the largest countries in the world, the most populous country in the world, China, and the largest country in the world by geography, the Soviet Union, they, had, they didn't have capitalist systems. They didn't trust capitalist systems. They had command economies where the government, some government bureaucrat would say, we need this many shoes and we need this many loaves of bread. So this idea that the market, the invisible hand of the market will do its thing and everybody will get what they want. Well, not everybody, not everybody gets what they want, but I mean, nobody ever does in this life. But the idea is this will give a closer approx approximation to people getting what they want than the previous system, the mercantilist system. And this idea, this capitalist idea, caught on in the United States. It started catching on in the first half of the 19th century, but it really took off in the second half of the 19th century. It coincided with the Industrial Revolution in America. The Industrial Revolution, the application of steam power to various tasks that previously had been done by human power or animal power or maybe water power. So hook up steam engines to the manufacturing process, hook up steam engines to the mining process, hook up steam engines even to the farming process. And all of a sudden, productivity just takes off and America gets rich. And so there was, you could say, you could say that there was a democratic revolution in America in the first half of the 19th century as this idea that people should be equal before the ballot box took hold. And it changed what had been inherited from the past and it put America on this path to, well, where we are today. Again, I have to point out that we still haven't achieved full equality, but if inequality cr crops up in politics, it has to be explained away. In the 1790s, it didn't have to be explained away at all. That was the point of the previous the aristocratic, aristocratic political system. Okay. In the second, if so, there's a democratic revolution in the first half of the 19th century, from 1800 to 1850. From 1850 to 1900, there's a capitalist revolution in America. And the capitalist revolution saw, first of all, the emergence of powerful corporations, big business. Until about 1850, businesses in the United States were not big. The typical business might have been business. Well, it might be a firm. They didn't even call them businesses. They, um, you know, today, if you want to create a company, you charter a company. And there are forms you, you fill out, and you can charter your company. In 
early days in America, you didn't do that. You had to, for a, for a charter, you had to apply to the state legislature, and it was a really tedious process. And so the, the system was not set up to establish these companies. Now, why, why a company? Why not just do business as myself? Ah, so this is one of the keys to the success of capitalism, the limited liability corporation. So if you have a great idea and you're going to make a zillion dollars with a new app or some new technique or a new battery technology that's going to power skateboards and scooters and cars and airplanes and everything else, you get this great idea. And to bring this idea to market, to bring these batteries, let's say, to market, it's going to cost some money. So you uh, borrow some money and you uh, get going. Or maybe if your credit's not so good, you try to line up investors. You talk to some venture capitalists and you say, this is a great idea, so give me some money. And they give you some money and they say, okay, give us part of the company. So you sell off shares of the company. And this is the way lots of things are done these days. But the key is that if it fails, and one of the things that capitalism thrives on is the willingness of people to take risks. If you have a limited liability corporation, it could be Inc., it could be LLC, it could be whatever it is. There are various suffixes for this. But basically it means that you are on the hook for only the resources you put into the corporation. So if you have some money you've saved up for college or for something else, you can keep that separate. The money, the, the debts that you incur in trying to run the business, um, you know, they're only, they're limited. That's why it's called limited liability corporation. They're limited to the amount that you put up. And so if your business fails, then your creditors come after you. They can't actually, they can't come after you. They come after the corporation. And if the corporation is not doing well, you declare, you declare bankruptcy. But your private wealth is separate from that. That's the whole idea. And the fact that you can shield your private wealth, you know, it might not be much, but you know, they can't take your car and they, you know, they can't uh, seize your other assets. Um, it's, it encourages people to take risks. And capitalism is built on a willingness to take risks. So that's part of it. The emergence of, oh, so there are companies. As a, uh, companies, they weren't even companies, they were just some guy has a blacksmith shop and he, he, he hired one or two people. The first big businesses in American life were railroads. And railroads at first were no fancier than stagecoach lines, except, except that the capital expense was higher because you had to acquire the right of way, you had to put down the tracks, that's a big capital expense. And so um, you had to raise the money, you had to borrow the money and it helped to have these limited liability provisions in the, the corporate charter. Um, but the, the railroads, they were the first companies to have hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of employees. And they were followed in the late 19th century by big businesses in other realms. So Andrew Carnegie became the titan of steel, and he built this huge steel corporation. John D. Rockefeller built a, the Standard Oil Trust. And big businesses occurred everywhere. And when big businesses occurred, some things changed about American life. Some things that showed that democracy and capitalism might sometimes be in conflict. If the principal value, the underlying premise of democracy is equality, a fundamental premise and certainly a byproduct of capitalism is inequality. Because inequality is what causes people to do one thing rather than another, to buy this thing rather than that. Inequality is is what, well, encourages people to work hard to make money. So Andrew Carnegie came to the United States from Scotland at the age of 12. His family was poor. His father had been thrown out of work by the Industrial Revolution in the textile industry in Britain. And he never could find another job. So the mother said, we're all going to America. They go to America and young Andy becomes the family's breadwinner at the age of 12. And Andrew Carnegie was smart, he was hardworking, he was shrewd, he was willing to take risks. And by the time he was 50 years old, he was one of the wealthiest people in America. He went from rags to riches. And one of the reasons he 
went from rags to riches. One of the reasons that he built up his company was the lure of inequality. I can get ahead. I can make myself better. I'm not restricted to equal pay, equal returns with everybody else. One of the advantages of socialism to those people who like socialism is a high degree of equality. In socialism, you tend not to have millionaires or these days billionaires. The, the, the pay scale is relatively flat. In capitalism, you have these enormous inequalities. And so the people who worked for Andrew Carnegie, they might make $2,000 a year at a time when he was making a million dollars a year. So this is, it's, it's this that makes the capitalist engine go. If you know anything about the way steam engines or heat engines have, uh, generally work, they operate on differences in temperature. And so they can utilize this difference of temperature to make things move. You put the, the hot steam into the, the cylinder and it moves the piston and the engine goes. This works for internal combustion engines too. Basically the same idea. So you need this inequality to make the engine of capitalism go. And furthermore, as the engine of capitalism operates, it tends to exacerbate inequality. And so today, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook, he was just another kid, college kid in his dorm. And he was, you know, thinking up, oh, what are these ideas and how can I connect people? You know, now Mark Zuckerberg is one of the wealthiest people in the world. When, Mark, when Jeff Bezos started selling books out of a warehouse in Seattle in the 1990s, you know, he was just, you know, just ordinary folks. And now he's the richest man in America and in dollar terms, the richest man in history. So the operation of the capitalist marketplace both requires inequality to operate and it tends to aggravate inequality. And it is this that sometimes, maybe all the time, gives rise to tension between democracy and capitalism. By the, by the 1890s, by the end of the 19th century, there was such concern about the enormous wealth of people like John Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie and J.P. Morgan the people thought that capitalism was destroying democracy. This was essentially what the populists said. You know, they said, we, democracy cannot survive if some people are so much wealthier than other people. Because John D. Rockefeller, yeah, it's true he has only one vote. You know, he has one vote and uh, the person who works in his oil refinery has one vote. Ah, yes, that's true, but John Rockefeller controls the livelihoods of all of these people. And in an elections like the election of 1896, Republicans, the capitalists, generally supported William McKinley. And some factory owners told workers, if McKinley doesn't win this election, don't bother coming to work the next day because we're going to have to shut down the plant. Now, this was partially a threat. It was partially their own fear of what would happen. They looked on William Jennings Bryan, the Democratic slash populist candidate, as this raving socialist who was going to make it po impossible for somebody to, for a company to turn a profit. And so it was partly their own fear. I mean, to some degree, they want to make sure their workers vote a Republican. And William McKinley duly won. And so even though a big boss like Rockefeller couldn't actually make his workers vote this way or that, the fact that they depended on him meant that they were going to listen when he said, you know, Standard Oil is going to have jobs for everybody only if William McKinley wins. So it's, there has been this tension that's existed. And in fact, there's a, you can sort of think about it as a pendulum that swings back and forth between democracy and capitalism. And the pendulum swung toward democracy in the first half of the 19th century. So democracy really took hold in the period from 1800 to 1850. And then the pendulum of American life and politics swung in the direction of capitalism in the second half of the 19th century. So by 1900, capitalism was roaring ahead of democracy. Then, then when people like the populists get upset at this and they say, okay, we've got to do something about it, that the populists didn't do it, but their heirs, their political heirs, the progressives did. And so in the, the first part of the 20th century, you get what you can call a, 
a democratic counter-revolution, and the pendulum slinks back toward democracy as the progressives inject more government control and regulation over the economy. The, the tension, the struggle between capitalism and, demo and democracy continues even today. We live at a time when people, many people are very concerned about growing inequality. And they ask, can democracy survive if some people like Jeff Bezos are so rich that they're utterly beyond government control? They tend to control the government rather than vice versa. It's a question that is going to be with us as long as we have democracy and capitalism.